Welcome to the British Society of Gerontology Special Interest Group on Aging, Business and Society Workshop, Empowering Social Gerontology to Work Effectively With and In Business. I'm Rob Walton, Deputy Chair of the SIG, and on behalf of everyone who's participated to prepare today's workshop, we are delighted that so many of you have come along to join us and to share your views and to just help us learn uh, around on and around this topic. Through its work and in pursuit of its mission, the BSG Special Interest Group, Aging Business and Society is uniquely placed to ask three critical questions of ourselves, our communities and our society. How can we empower social gerontology to work effectively within and in and within business? How can we support business to better understand older people and aging? How can we enable the WHO decade for healthy aging? We're going to start to explore those questions today with what we hope will be an exciting, inclusive and conclusive series of events that help us to think strategically and creatively about opportunities and challenges, solutions and impact. I'll tell you more about what's coming up at the end of the session, but first let's get down to business. This afternoon, we'll hear from a range of longevity leaders who are passionate about working in partnership. It's our hope that we address and explore what it means to empower social gerontologists to work effectively with and in business, why it's important and how we can really work together to make a difference. Leading us through the sessions are our facilitators, Alison Ben Zimra, Head of Research and Influence at United St. Xavier's Charity and a member of the BSG's own ERA Committee, and Paul Clarkson, Senior Lecturer in Social Care at the University of Manchester. Before I hand over to Alison and Paul, though, just a few housekeeping points. There is a workshop. This is a workshop. And so we're really keen to hear from you. We've enabled both audio and video for all delegates, but please do be respectful of other participants and where possible, use hands up buttons or, or wave to the screen and allow the facilitators to bring you in. We'll also be breaking into workshops and you will be teleported to breakout rooms uh, and then back into the main room automatically. So really there's no need for additional action on your part. And finally, just to emphasize that the success of this event is down to all of us. So please participate fully, bring your energy, your head, your heart, but most of all, bring your voice. And thank you and, and over to Alison and Paul. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Rob. Um, as Rob mentioned, my name is Alison Ben Zimra. I'm Head of Research and Influence at United St. Saviour's Charity, which is based in Southwark, London. Uh, the charity manages a portfolio of properties, and the income generated from those properties is distributed between social housing for older people and then grant making for organizations in the borough. I manage various research projects with academic partners and funders. Um, as Rob mentioned, I'm also on the BSG Emerging Researchers in Aging Committee. Um, my career in healthy aging started when I ran a business which provided wellness programs for older people living in their own homes. Um, I became fascinated, fascinated by the network of care and support which enabled an older person to remain living in their own communities. But as an entrepreneur, I was particularly interested in developing business models which enabled this. So this uh, motivated me to pursue my master's in innovation at the Graduate School of Business in Cape Town. And in learning more about innovation, I came to really value the role that research played in this ecosystem. So over the past few years, my career has more focused on the research element and I've worked in the space between research, innovation, and social enterprise. So my involvement in the special interest group, I wear three hats. Uh, the first one is I represent research with older people, and I'm particularly passionate about ensuring that older people are at the center of research and innovation. Um, the second hat that I wear is supporting gerontologists who may be looking at alternative careers outside academia. And then the third hat that I wear is, having never lost my entrepreneurial spirit, is contributing to the efforts of bringing academia and business closer together in addressing the needs of older people. 
So to give you background and context to this workshop, the motivation and intention for this workshop was to ensure that we can empower social gerontologists to work effectively with and in business. So by answering this question, we can accelerate and amplify the role of gerontology in helping business and society to prepare for the challenges and opportunities of an aging and older population, and ultimately to help and enable older people to live independently and be able to do the things that give their life meaning. So we're really pleased to have a dynamic group of panelists join us this afternoon to address these issues. Um, our first panelist is Professor Ian Philp. Ian is the founder of Age Care Technologies. Age Care Technology is the winner of the 2021 United Nations WSIS Prize for Innovation in Healthy Aging for their potential to add 100 million quality life years for older people and reduce global costs of long-term care by $45 trillion. Professor Philp is an advisor to the World Health Organization in person-centered care for older people. He holds a doctorate in medicine from the University of Edinburgh and was a practicing physician for 35 years in the UK National Health Insurance uh, Service spending eight years as an executive medical director. As professor of healthcare for older people at the University of Sheffield, he led teams which won the UK hospital team of the year in the care of older people and the Queen's anniversary prize for higher education for research into improving the quality of life of older people. From 2000 to 2008, he was a national clinical director for older people in England leading the development and implementation of the National Service Framework for Older People, campaigning to ensure respect for dignity and care and eliminate age discrimination, leading national strategies for intermediate care, stroke, dementia, and the prevention of falls and fractures. Professor Philp was awarded a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2009 in recognition of the work to improve the lives of older people. We also have joining us Sharon Rose. Sharon is a social gerontologist with a master's degree from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Sharon is focused on creating and implementing programs for intergenerational communities, healthy aging, and integrating gerotechnology devices that enhance everyday lifestyle choices. As a speaker and moderator, she has developed and conducted inspiring intergenerational programs such as the one with students at Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida, and residents of the senior community at Edgewater at Boca Raton Point, and with several multi-generational communities in Palm Beach County. She also continues to expand her reach in this marketplace to international organizations and businesses. So welcome, Sharon. Um, we're hoping to have Ian Sheriff join us. We know that he's tied up in meetings, but hopefully he will be able to join us. But just as an introduction to Ian, Ian is an academic partnership lead for dementia at the University of Plymouth. He has roles on many external bodies, trustee and board member of the Alzheimer's Society, member of the Prime Minister's Dementia Champion Group, chair of the Prime Minister's Rural Dementia Friendly Task and Finish Group, and chair of the PM's Dementia Air Transport Group. Ian works with the aviation industry and many other businesses promoting dementia-friendly practices and processes. He is involved in research projects looking into support for older people with dementia, living at home and their family carers. I'm gonna hand over to Paul, um, who will introduce himself and then chair the discussion with the panelists. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks, Alison, and, and welcome, folks. I'm um, so pleased to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Paul Clarks, and I'm Senior Lecturer in Social Care at the University of Manchester. I'm an applied researcher, really, over many decades. I've worked uh, with um, older people and um, other businesses, community interest companies, etc., small and medium uh, enterprises in the social care space. Uh, I'm an evaluator with these businesses, principally. Um, my role at the University of Manchester is also um, 
in terms of uh, career development and, and capacity development of researchers in social care research, which is an undeveloped area. And I work a lot with one of the major uh, research funders uh, um, in the UK, which is National Institute for Health Research. I'm part of the National Capacity Building Management Team for social care research uh, in England. Um, and I've worked for many, many years uh, on research projects and managed research projects, principally, latterly, uh, in the field of dementia and dementia care research. Uh, I recently worked with Ian Sheriff, who, who um, Alison has just mentioned, uh, and um, previously undertook many um, policy evaluations on older people's care um, funded by the Department of Health. Uh, one of the most notable was the evaluation of the single assessment process for older people uh, by the Department of Health. Um, so I'm a capacity builder, but I do work with uh, businesses uh, and to, to help me with my evaluations and to help them um, evaluate their, their products and their, their approaches to the care of older people. So that's me. I'll just briefly talk to you uh, through the agenda for you. Um, we're, ho we're hoping to have some remarks from our panelists just uh, in a few in a few moments. I'll ask each of them in turn to just say a little bit more about themselves than, than Alison's introduced to you, and particularly uh, what their thoughts are about the opportunities and challenges of working with business to give uh, to give us a little bit of a framework for our breakout groups, so that so that you can have something to pin your ideas on. Um, once we've had those remarks from um, each of our panellists, um, you'll be led into the breakout sessions, as Rob said at, right at the beginning, automatically. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to even lift a finger, I believe. Uh, you'll be a, a, the group that you, you'll be in, the breakout group. There are two breakout groups, group one and group two. You'll be automatically assigned to, to each of those groups based on your um, experiences. Um, and interests. Uh, so that will happen automatically after we've gone through um, the open, opening remarks of, of our panellists. So I'd, I'd like to um, give some opening remarks on Ian Sherry's behalf, first of all. As Alison said, he is delayed. He's a, a, a valued colleague of mine. Um, Ian works a lot with businesses, principally most recently with the av aviation industry, which is a massive uh, undertaking. And his, his role really is to open up um, uh, conversations with them and evaluation possibilities uh, to look at um, whether um, businesses can orientate themselves towards um, dementia friendly practices. And he's working with the aviation industry on that, but he's worked with other industries, rural groups, town and parish councils, et cetera, to try and find uh, ways to promote dementia friendly practices and uh, aging well practices with businesses. So that's Ian, uh, who's been a colleague of mine for a long, long time. I'd like to just bring Sharon in now. Sharon, if you could just say a little bit about yourself in this space and, and some things to hang it on, and then I'll, I'll bring Ian Philp in. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Paul. And to the group, first of all, I'd like to thank this esteemed group of professionals in gerontology for bringing me in as, as the international piece of it, which is from the US. Um, we've been getting to know each other quite a bit and we all fit together. And I wanted to first say that one of the exciting things about gerontology and specifically social gerontology is that so many roads are leading to us, so many different careers and professions. And that's very exciting since the beginning was mostly about social work, psychology, and very old people in very poor condition. Now we have this exciting new time where in the United States it's the boomer generation, which is named elsewhere with other titles, but it's the largest the United States has ever seen. So what we have now is an equation of, in many states, or a 65 and old, older is larger population than the 18 and under population. And when you start doing the math, you'll see that we really do need to, to focus on the 65 and over as repurposed, re-identified, engaging in the world, being fit, being exciting, want to stay in, in the game. 
Um, and we do. And in addition to that, the 85 and over population is one of the largest growing populations here, and they are well. So this ages piece, which was brought up about the, uh, the UN and WHO with the challenge for aging healthy is a big piece of what's happening. And the phrase of kick the can down the road is no longer effective. It needs to be thrown out. It's not a part of who we are. And that's the exciting component for gerontology, both here in the UK and around the world. It's a real dynamic population and the addressing of the, from my side of the products being delivered and the engagement from the older generation, meaning 40 and over, 15 over, 16 over, wherever you want to place it. I see some smiles because you don't have to define it that way anymore. So I'm excited about the, the consulting piece of it where I work hands-on with the population that is either in the business world, in the agency world, in the academic world and bring us all together to make sure we're doing research and development to make sure that we are strategically purposeful. And that's um, what I'm excited about. I can speak more, but I'm so excited about getting started and getting into the groups. Thank you so much for having, here, having me here and I look forward to the next sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Uh, I think business is having to change mindsets to deal with um, some modern day circumstances as you've described, but also academia is having to as well, isn't it, to support business and uh, to support evaluation. So. Uh, at, at this point, I'd like to bring um, Ian Philpin and, and really ask you, Ian, um, to say a little bit about yourself, where you come to this in particular, you know, to add on what's already been said about you, which is a lot by Alison. Uh, and you come to this through a particular route, don't you, Ian, in terms of setting up a business model now with, with your company uh, based on your uh, extensive experience previously. Ian, over to you for a sec. Thank you, Paul. And very nice to be introduced by you and Alison and to follow on from Rose um, and um, to join this discussion that we're going to have this afternoon with a very wonderful group of people. Um, I wanted to talk about purpose um, for a gerontologist working with or in business. Um, and I when I look back at my own career, um, there's been a common thread or purpose that, that runs through it, whatever hat I've been wearing. Um, and um, some of the interest I have in this whole topic of the interface between business and gerontology and society is that there, there can be false divides based on sort of tribal behaviours and language and norms and expectations. But actually, what unites us, as I hope will become even more evident as we talk about this uh, today, is, uh, is the sense of common purpose. Um, I found my vocation as a medical student, um, I was a bit put off medicine, having had a sort of rather arrogant change the world philosophy in my mind, having gone off to Spain and joined Spain when it was liberating itself from fascism. And, um, and um, and then came back to study the anatomy of the armpit and decided that medicine wasn't for me until I discovered geriatrics um, as a specialty that had all the excitement, I thought, around making a difference, compassionate care, practical focus, and a strong sense of reason and scientific underpinnings. I worked for several of the great pioneers of geriatric medicine who had all these amazing attributes. Um, and one of them said to me that, um, in his career, this was Jimmy Williamson, he'd identified a problem, which was that two thirds of the things that matter most to older people are not reported. And he said, I saw, I, I found the problem, but I didn't find the solution. And he asked me to find the solution. And that, that inspired 30 years of research and development um, with work across many countries and with wonderful colleagues to come up with practical solutions to identify the things that really matter to older people and then connect them to information services. And I think now we should be connecting older people to, through a marketplace model as well, to products and services that can meet the things that matter to them. Um, and I founded my business late in life, Age Care Technologies, three years ago um, to take a business model to implementing that, that, that 
approach and to try and get it out to as many people in the world as possible for both commercial and social purpose reasons. But the, what I've learned is that, well, first of all, two previous attempts were made to commercialize the approach. They both failed. I was involved in both. Um, and entrepreneurship business is risky. It's scary. Things go wrong. And you can be on your own. And even with aged care technologies, we ran out of money last summer and I had to put my own money into the business just to keep things going, pay the contractors. And our contractors were very kind and offered to delay payments and so on. So it, it's a scary world and um, it carries risk, but it carries huge opportunity. Um, as a gerontologist, business can be a wonderful vehicle, either as a gerontologist advising businesses to get things right, you know, for older people, understand older people, understand aging. Um, there's two aspects to this, and Sharon talked a lot about aging and staying healthy, and then there are older people, you also talked about that, and there's the two pillars around that. But both, in both cases, good entrepreneurship informed by gerontological reason can make a huge difference in this world. And that's my motivation. That's where my sense of purpose comes. And I think it's incredibly exciting. And I'd, I'd encourage others to get involved, gerontologists to get involved with business, partner with business, set up your own business, work in a large business because of the opportunities to make a difference. Um, and particularly if you don't mind a level of risk and have a safe place to go when things go wrong, which they don't just go wrong in a sort of occasional big scale, they, they go wrong five times every day as an entrepreneur and you have to fix it. So it is a different world from academia. It has its own pressures, but it also has its own joys and opportunities. That, that, that you know, like, like others have said, keen to get into the discussion, but thank you for listening. Thanks Ian, I think that, that distinction is useful and that, uh, that thought, you know, distinction between um, aging research, long, longevity research, uh, and uh, what I call care research, which is what I've been involved in. There are the sort of two pillars of um, evaluations and research with older people, aren't they, in social gerontology. And we're, we're both, uh, you, you and I, Ian, have been involved in, in both those aspects. And, and you identify also the entrepreneurial spirit argument, which is coming more to the fore in academia as well as business. And it, and it does help uh, academics like myself to work with business because the funders like it as well and we're we're under pressure now to bring the research monies into universities etc and working with business does present a great opportunity to us uh, as evaluators so uh, bear those thoughts in mind when you enter the breakout groups lots of different issues lots of different opportunities and challenges even aren't they um, so we're, we're, we're going into two breakout groups. I think that happens automatically, Rob, at, at uh, about 4.30, does it, which we're coming up to. Um, we can sort of have a glass of water, clear our mind a little bit before we come. Um, so there'll, there'll be two, two breakout groups, uh, opportunities and challenges for um, social gerontologists to work with business and opportunities and challenges for uh, business or transition uh, social gerontologists um, transition into business or business persons to work with uh, social gerontologists uh, is the other breakout room so you'll you'll enter those automatically and then we'll be welcomed back that also happen automatically and then myself and Alison will um, draw conclusions from that well, there'll be a um, a report from each group, Rob, is that right? And uh, they will report back to myself and Alice. Yeah, so if you can elect yourselves a, a representative, it would be lovely to, to hear from people in the audience uh, to represent the report outs from group one and two. Uh, we can send you right away. Uh, so if that's okay with you, Paul, we'll just open the rooms. If there's anybody left here, uh, please just uh, make yourselves known through the chat and we will do our best to to, uh, to manage the technology. So I'm going to open these rooms now. Rob, how, what, what would you like us to do next? So I think the idea is, is for people now to uh, walk us through it. If you can facilitate us through session uh, one, uh, I think we're looking for feedback from the first uh, breakout session and then feedback uh, from the second. Brilliant. So Tim very um, generously offered to give the feedback from breakout room one. So, sure. Tim, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. I'll try to summarise um, some of what we discussed and I'll inevitably miss some of the contributions. So apologies and please do fill in any gaps, maybe in the chat or shouting out whatever's, whatever's best. Um, so we had a really interesting conversation um, and we started off from the position of um, seeing that people often are kind of in researchers applying for innovation projects, but um, not uh, and have the right motivations, but are sometimes poorly guided and don't have the right information about how they can engage well and how they can build what they need to build um, and some often like naivety around business um, and what businesses can do for them what businesses might want from them um, tina talked about how purpose is key to align groups together um, although there can be challenges around um, politics individual agendas um, that need to be persistent and, and but the, the um, purpose is the right place to start um, we heard a bit about some of the kind of tensions that can be there with these partnerships. So, for example, different measures of impact for businesses about what comes next and developing the product um, uh, or kind of developing sales, getting, getting it out there. Um, whereas researchers often they're incentivized to need papers and that's a primary output for them. Um, also, the speed with which people work um, can be very different. Um, and the importance of getting this partnership conversations right from the beginning. Uh, we talked quite a bit about um, partnership and how we can support better partnerships. Um, that might include entrepreneurship courses. It might be really understanding what collaboration means and what that, how, that, how that's different between the um, business world and the world of research um, and perhaps help enabling researchers and businesses to kind of develop clear objectives for partnerships and getting that set from the start. Um, we talked a little bit about the many different things that engaging in business can mean, and there's not just one way for researchers to get involved. Um, they don't have to be the CEO of a company. There's lots of other things that people can do and helping people understand those options, understand what's the best fit for their needs, their interests, their projects um, might be really helpful. Um, uh, we talked that it can be uh, a big challenge to, for a researcher who's not used to business. To, to work out what they need to do to be successful there, it can be a really fulfilling challenge to learn how to run a business and to see your research make that impact. And I think that impact is a, is a big issue. So we talk about um, the context of, of business, why people should be engaging in, in this as a way to get a really big impact for their research. Um, I think that was a, a key point. We, uh, we finished yeah, talking about collaborations and, and how we can strengthen those, but I think um, yeah, bring that back to the impact and seeing business as the way that, um, as a way for people, researchers to increase the impact they want to make, I think is a really good way to get people on, involved. So I guess that, you know, to your point, Tim, it's now is a really good time to, to sort of ask, uh, does any of the uh, guests, do any of the guests that we have here, uh, any questions for Tim or any of the panelists feel like uh, there was a deviation distraction uh, anything that Tim didn't say right, and so uh, now's your chance. And I also see that we're really fortunate to have Ian Sheriff here. Uh, I know that Ian has been a big part of our agenda today, and you just joined, I think. So I wanted to welcome Ian, uh, say hello, and and please, Ian, as we go through these next two sessions of feedback, we would really value uh, any comments that you, you you might care to give. And of course, please, uh, if you have a moment to. Uh, to tell us a bit about yourself and what, what drives you in this space and why it's important to you, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. But let's just see if there are any questions first. Okay, great, Ian, please. Well, I am sorry, Chair, that I have arrived so late. I was chairing a meeting between politicians and people living with dementia and their families, which um, was quite interesting and uh, quite challenging questions, but also some very uh, good answers back. I just to say who I am, I'm Ian Sheriff, I'm the Academic Partnership Lead for Dementia here at the University of Plymouth Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. But I do a lot of work outside. I, whilst I research and teach here, I chair the Prime Minister's Rural Dementia Group, the Prime Minister's Air Transport Group, and I chair a global group. And I've got projects running in Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Uganda, uh, and in China and also in Japan. Um, and I suppose the, my sort of limited knowledge of working in business was um, I was given the task to chair the Prime Minister's Air Transport Group and make a difference for people living with dementia or hidden disabilities across the whole piece. And um, 
it's quite interesting when you try and get uh, airports because they're all independent and also getting uh, airlines on board. And I think what I learned very early was to say there are X amount of million people who would like to fly but couldn't. And oh, by the way, that will bring extra revenue. And it's amazing how many people turned up when I mentioned that word and how much they, they wanted to get involved, but they did. And within 18 months to two years, we changed the whole agenda of um, air travel for people with hidden disability. We wrote different standards uh, that um, airports need to follow. And that was supported totally by the CAA. We had debates in the House of Commons, debates in uh, the House of Parliament, uh, sorry, in the House of Lords. And we also had the, the Minister for Transport on the group. And so they saw it as a worthwhile collective to get together to try and solve the issues uh, that people were suggesting were happening. So business came on board very quickly. And also in my uh, Prime Minister's Rural Dementia Group, we have about, oh, I don't know, 60 odd uh, different organisations and companies on that. And we don't just cover England, we cover England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So I, th I, I think I learned very uh, earlier on, you, you have to sometimes structure your conversation around engaging businesses in the world that they're in and not in our sort of um, uh, social world. Uh, and that proved to be very successful. And I'm, I'm, dare I say, I don't like using the word, but using that same sort of technique in my uh, work within um, China and also Japan and in Africa. So that that's me as a simpleton. Uh, what are my thoughts are, uh, I don't have masses of um, uh, knowledge about business, but I found that that magic word revenue, but then also customer care that actually uh, went down well uh, in the whole process. And perhaps I'm being a bit sort of tongue in cheek here, but they did pull out the stops and work very hard over two years, three years to change the world. And, and we're doing it again now. I mean, I on my rural dementia group, we've suddenly had some really bad issues being flagged up about um, farming uh, and some of the issues that they, they are going through. So this may sound a bit trite, but we've invented a system. We're trying it now. It's called Angels in Gumboots. And they are businesses and organizations that can parachute themselves into a farm that's failing and to see how they can bring it back up on stream. Um, I've yet to see these angels in their gum boots. I, that's my, <laughs> but it's a concept that we put together. Uh, and that includes businesses, organizations that work in that sort of um, uh, environment. So just, you know, there's, there's obviously there's a lot more things going on, but that's my initial overview and I'm quite prepared to take questions if you wish, Chair. I would be delighted if you, I'm sorry, my mute button is uh, ever so uh, difficult today, uh, but I would be delighted if anybody had any questions for you. I thought it was a really powerful testimony and I see already that Sharon, uh, Sharon Rose. I'm welcoming you to the United States. You listed countries that are not the United States, but- Sorry, I, I am working in the United States. I work with um, uh, Laurie LeBay, who, this is another interesting aspect of the word. I always have the BBC on my um, groups because they can become the voice. And in America, I'm working with Laurie LeBay, who is Alzheimer's radio, and it broadcasts across the States. Sorry, Sharon, I oh, interrupted you. Because there's also, there's dementia groups here, dementia association and so on, that yeah. are steeply involved, and also in Japan, they have um, dementia programs where with, and, and also in Miami, while well, speaking here in the United States of Miami with uh, age friendly communities where they have grocery stores that are um, not in transportation, grocery stores that are aware of those who have uh, issues, whether it be dementia or some other issue. And then the bus drivers know, they know they've identified these folks and help them carry on their lives in a seamless way 
But the transportation piece, that's fascinating. I'd love to have more about that. Well, we've, we've written a book, Sharon, and oh. I hope it's coming here. Uh, uh, that's coming out pretty soon. But we formed a group called I Dare, and that's a uh, sort of a breakaway group for the Prime Minister's group. And on that, we've got America, Canada, uh, Japan, China, um, and Australia. But definitely, oh. we're trying. The difficulty I found with the United States, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but you have all these things called states, and they all have their own way of doing things. <laughs> and that proves very difficult when you try to bring in a, uh, something across the piece. And uh, so, but um, no, honestly, some of the things you've just raised, I mean, I, I, Japan has been over to Plymouth and seen what we're doing and seen my work and I I spent just before lockdown uh, about three weeks in Japan I chaired their international conference but also we were <laughs> chatting on about some of the things that we could share and do together so um, they're a very go-ahead sort of side communities this is great uh this is great, Ian. Thank you so much uh, for this. I, I really am just very conscious that we have a hard close at 5.30. We have two 10-minute sessions now. Paul, would you walk us through uh, break room, breakout room two, and then we'll go to conclusions for the, for the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I, I volunteered to be the reporter back for breakout group two, uh, but if uh, my colleagues who were on that uh, breakout room could just add things if I miss anything out. But essentially, to save time also, Rob, um, a, a lot of our discussion really centred on um, a lot of the issues that Tim described. So, you know, the two cultures of academia and business working together, different languages, uh, different time demands, different time, almost different time zones, I suppose. Academic uh, work is sometimes looks slow to a, to a business uh, person uh, and from the business world sometimes... Um, it, it looks like they've got more, more demands, immediate demands, and, and a faster-paced uh, approach to, to, to their work than academia. Um, but on the positive side, uh, it was certainly the focus for the discussion was, I think, James, you described it as um, a, a, a nascent field, ageing and, and longevity uh, work and uh, ageing research. There's almost never been a better time for businesses to engage in that agenda. It certainly opens up opportunities for them. There's there's a, a, a lot of possible opportunities uh, uh, for new customers and new business models, not just in technology, but also in supporting um, the aging population, which we're all part of. So it, it kind of starts from it's starting earlier, Sharon, isn't it? Than it used to be perceived, you know, from age forty onwards where we're sort of beginning to change our preferences and want different products and businesses are, are sort of um, scouring to help us. So there's that, there's, there's never been a better time to engage in that agenda for businesses, but also for um, gerontology and ageing research, never been a better time. Um, it's just getting some of the um, obstacles out of the way, I think. And one of the obstacles from the academic side that was mentioned is the kind of short-term nature of research funding and that from the outside world it looks like researchers like myself uh, sort of have it we can have our cake and eat it it's a little bit easy we just get the money in we can do evaluations and we can work with business if we want uh, we can be quite entrepreneurial in that uh, but often that uh, there's a lot of rejections of research grants it's about 90 percent currently the, the grant applications that are not successful and then we have to move on to another project and we've kind of lost our partners our business partners because they've moved on to something else so that's one of the um, sort of obstacles um, and how you get around that I think was the general opinion was it, it, it's got to start early you've got to form partnerships with um, business leaders and, and, and business providers as, as academic researchers. And that takes time. It, it's like um, people talk to people uh, was my phrase. I think it, it's, we've become a lot more entrepreneurial than perhaps a decade ago in universities. And we want to foster those relationships, but it takes time. And often there's no funding to do that. You've got to look at the next project. Um, but there are capacity development funds coming through now from research funders to perhaps enable that. 
um, to take place that we can foster those relationships and because um, we need research partners and, and the businesses want want academic partners it helps them grow their business and, and get resources for their business if they can evaluate their product and work with uh, with academics so there's a kind of meeting of minds i think uh, it, it's never been a better time we also had a couple of international um, contributors to our discussion which was really interesting because they they they're of the opinion that the uk is far ahead of um, other countries uh, internationally in terms of working with business which sort of surprised me i thought we were still sort of stuck a little bit but um, there was a lot of positivity there about the uk funding and uk uh, models and universities the way they work a, a lot more sort of progressive than than internationally a lot, a lot of difficulties internationally i think and that may vary by country i suppose but um, that was an interesting point and the last point i made rob is that it's kind of a positive point about this group really it was considered that um, our special interest group might be one one mechanism by which we can foster these relationships that I've just described, you know, foster these long term collaborations between academics and business. And we might be a, a kind of um, enabler of that, uh, this group and, and introduce people to each other. There were already two people introduced to each other on our uh, on our discussion, which uh, it was great. They're starting a relationship now. So. So we've done some good just discussing this uh, this topic. So that's that's it from me. Lots of different issues, um, but on the whole, a positive discussion, I think. Well, it feels also like a perfect segue to to draw it all back together and to start to think about. Okay, we we deliberately had two different conversations running. Of course, they've overlapped, and we fully expected that to happen. But it would be good now to do a kind of compare and contrast, and let's you know, see what those, uh, you know, key issues arise in that we feel are the most important things to be addressing, um, you know, in terms of the insight that we've gathered. It, it feels like the right time to be having that conversation. But bef just before we go there, I would just like to check uh, with the panelists of Breakout uh, Group 2. Um, was everything Paul said uh, to your satisfaction? Was there uh, uh, anything that was missed? Uh, anything additional that you'd like to add? Okay, great. So um, I guess now is the time that we'd really like to sort of hear from you, Alison and Paul. Let's let's get your sense and start this conversation off uh, about, about what you drew from, from this and, and let's brainstorm that through. Mm. The, the comments were really um, valuable from both breakout rooms. I think what kind of resonates between the two is creating opportunities for the different sectors to meet and engage with each other. Um, and, and like Paul said, this is a great opportunity for the special interest group to foster that. Um, as I mentioned, when, I've, when we first joined the call, I'm also on the Emerging Researchers in Aging Committee. And I think what we really get from our membership is this precarity um, in careers in academia. And so the, the more we can foster and nurture emerging gerontologists, um, just to provide them with, you know, ample opportunities and direction. Um, and I think the other thing that kept coming out of our, of our group, and I think it also relates to what, what Ian was saying in, in speaking the same language. So, you know, mm -hmm. underlined revenue and customer, customer care, um, but that language is important. And how do we ensure that, that academia and business are speaking the same language so that there's a mutual understanding? Paul? Yeah, I just pick up on that, Alison, that's very important. And those were wise words, Ian, from your extensive um, experience. And we're working together on research at the moment, Ian, aren't we? And it's um, it's good to see you here. So thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I I'd echo that. Sometimes it, it's about using shared language. That's important. But but I think from our group, certainly, it, it's also about making, you know, honestly making your language that you use transparent to the uh, other side, shall we say. So academics often um, don't sort of tell business people exactly how it is for them and what their impediments are. And I think an honest um, discussion of that helps the business owner or business person to appreciate that well, you know, this person wants to work with me, but they've got to sort this out first within their institution and vice versa. The business person perhaps has to sort of be honest about their perceptions of, uh, of um, working with uh, academia and 
and what their per, per particular impediments are in the business world. I mean, it, it's very precarious sometimes, as Ian mentioned right at the beginning, isn't it? The business world changes by the day. It's very, uh, very difficult and very risky. Uh, so to put that across to the academic, um, then we are speaking the same language because academic work is very precarious, as Alison has mentioned uh, just recently. So we, we are in the same space in a way, but traditionally, I think we've talked different languages, haven't we? But certainly my discussion was very positive that perhaps we've moved on a little bit over the last uh, decade or half a decade in terms of our different worlds that they're perhaps joining together a lot more aren't they? there's a lot more um, funding available to work with business certainly to universities so it there's never been a better time in a way that was the sort of theme of our discussion i think yeah and actually that piece about striking while the iron is hot and there's never been a better time i'm going to jump in and try there's not a better time to, to actually bring this audience in to to participate in some of the conversation i'd really like to uh i see that george has his hand up uh, george would you like to uh to join us yeah just so very briefly I, I don't think business and academic will ever speak the same language or, or that this group will ever be able to influence that but um, helping people to understand the difference between what people say and what people mean is a, is a really important um, part of this. And I think we talked a lot about in the group about the mechanisms to help gerontologists understand business you know, on this thing. I think there will be um, a separate thing about making the case for reaching out to academics to understand things in, in subsequent workshops. But, but yeah, I, I mean, trying to trying to sort of um, interpret is an important, uh, I think, skill in this. This is a great point. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask the group was um, th there's this uh, phrase that we're using, which is about empowered gerontology. And I wanted to go to Ian, but I also wanted to open this question up is from the discussions that you have, this idea of a vision of change, a vision of um, the future, is really sitting around this this phrase of empowerment in gerontology. So, what was said about that? And what what are the? I'd particularly like to ask uh, Ian, you know, what his view on that is as well, and bring Tina in. So let let's um, let's hear from you. Which which Ian? Okay. I'm you and um, yeah yeah Ian Ian. <laughs> I mean, the power you wield, Chair, you, you just switch me off and switch me on. I'm just amazed at this Zoom thing. <laughs> I think one of the, I, I think, George, you're, you're quite correct. I mean, business uh, can be a bit sort of uh, a wary of us when we come in. And uh, one of the big things I found was commercial sensitive, uh, working with the airlines. So when you worked with a said airline, um, they would say, well, don't tell any, you know, I don't want to share this with any other airline because that'll put them in a, you know, they would become a leader in this, this part of the world. So I think that's another word that needs to be brought in. As far as um, making them aware of, um, you know, the gerontology, the older people's needs and stuff. I think, you know, I, I, I wonder sometimes if we, we actually tell the story uh, about what what is required and how we tell the story. Um, I often read lots of things in UEA, you know, University of Third Age, about what our needs are uh, and when those needs start. And business can come on board and look at those. I mean, we are the uh, biggest spenders of. Um, uh, we have a lot more money than some of the other groups in our communities, and so that is an attractive thing. I've reached a sensitive age of 77 and I get all manner of people sending me things that I should be buying, be that sort of holiday places in Spain or what have you. So we are a market uh, and that market needs to be exploited as far as academics go. Um, so Ian, sorry to interrupt, but on this empowered gerontology angle, I think this discussion we've had represents empowered gerontology. I think we've had a gerontological discussion. We've had an academic discussion that has analysed a problem and has come up with a set of testable hypotheses right. about how better gerontologists could work with and in business. And I think our job and responsibility as a special interest group is to pull out 
the meaning of the discussions that we've had. Um, the key questions that have been raised, I think Tina's earlier analysis of some of the, if you like, the social anthropology around the relationship and the differences in language, motivation, behavior, and so on is, is really helpful. And I hope we've captured that. I will come back to you, Tina, for that. But I think then as a group, we need to move then from this analysis to what are the specific things in a modest way, and I agree with George, we're not going to solve this and create one big happy family, all speak the same language, but we, we have described, I think, throughout a sense of common purpose. And Ian, your comments about the, the work that you're doing represents that as well, the common purpose to improve people's lives. So for me, the take home message is that this has been an extremely empowered and empowering discussion that illustrates how gerontology can really impact and how um, we can help gerontologists to have even greater impact in what's important to them through working with and in business. That, that's my take home from the discussion. I, I agree. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't hear the first part, the, the, the two hours that you've been chatting to each other. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Can I hear from Alison? I see you've got your hand up. And, and just to the point that uh, Ian mentioned Tina, if Tina's still here, we'd love to hear a bit more of that, that language that you've been using. I think just briefly that gerontologists don't necessarily have the skills needed um, to either run a business or to work within business. So it's almost capacity building with, with a different set of skills that complements their academic gerontology skills. Tina? Yeah, I, I'll just come on, uh, you know, because George made that point about language and language keeps on coming up. So I do think language is important. And I just think it's about, it's, it's really about reframing sort of what this is all about into a much more positive um, and you, you mentioned the word empower, but, you know, to Ian's point, you know, we have, we have a lot of power. I mean, commercial power and actually aspirational ambitions, you know, the, the baby, you know, the baby boomers generation X, you know, people in sort of late fifties like myself. I mean, we want something completely different. And I'm afraid a lot of the, the products and services that are out there really don't speak to me at all. I mean, you know, I get these, these mail, these mailers for all these retirement villages, which would absolutely, I would, I would be so depressed if I ever had to live in a place like that. And it's just sort of like, you know, none of it speaks to me in the sort of person who I am and will continue to be as long as I've got my health and energy. Um, and I'm sure that goes for a lot of people. And I just think we have to just be far more bullshit, really. I mean, because ageism is unfortunately really a, a, still a massive issue, but it's also, it's because we have this very negative view of what growing older is all about. So we have to completely change that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and I think language is important. And I really do think the, uh, you know, there is a language that we all have to kind of sign up to that is just so much richer positive different you know and speaks to us as just human beings rather than just as old people <laughs> um so that, that's um, great to you yeah thank, thank you so much i see that sharon is there and i also see judith phillips is in uh, the audience so i wonder if maybe judith would like to give us a few words as well sharon please you're on mute there we go. Um, I would like to introduce a concept for us to carry on into the next meetings. It's called environmental gerontology. It was, I had this course with Mary Fran DeRose at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. It's about universal design. It's about aging in place. It's about your, your forever home. It's about being in communities together, the intergenerational component, the multi-generational component. And this is a, a wonderful place for us to maybe use as one of our priorities as to how it is evolving now around the world and how it also helps us to see that the 40, 50, 60, whatever plus are engaged and want to live comfortably in their homes and be uh, with smart homes, which is the technology piece of it as well. I think we wanna hear more about that. We'll come back to you after the meeting. Um, Judith, are you around? Uh, yeah, I am indeed, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, Rob, rather, sorry. Um, yes, I've been agreeing with everything everyone has said, and I think it's this is a great opportunity in, in this network to really push the boundaries. 
Uh, but I do agree with uh, George and Ian. We need specific things that we can work on because we can't change everything. Um, and, you know, ageism, as Tina has outlined, is, is so endemic. It's just, you know, we, we can chip away at it. But I think actually having specific areas that we are looking at and particularly working with our early career researchers and entrepreneurs as well who show an interest in aging i think you know getting those networks together um to change the our future leaders then is going to be really important um and it's an exciting area to be working in so i think we need to um, work through our other networks to to really make a difference there with um capacity building Thank you, Judith. Um, I would love to come to uh, back to the delegates and do one more walk through this, but we are actually, unfortunately, out of time. Uh, and so with that in mind, I, I just would like to just give you a heads up that the next meeting of the BSG SIG on Aging Business and Society will take place on Wednesday, the 23rd. I apologize for my poor PowerPoint skills, the 23rd of February uh, this year. It will start at 5 p.m. Uh, it's scheduled to start at 5 p.m. And that will be led by uh, George McGuinness and Debbie Keeling. The, the question we'll be trying to answer will be supporting business to better understand older people and aging. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for everything that you've done, all the contributions you've made, the great testimony. Uh, I really appreciate the flexibility that people have shown. I know it's a busy time with COVID and governments and the world but everybody came here and 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 had a go and uh contributed and so thank you so much it, it means such a lot to all of us um please uh look at the bsg website uh check out linkedin and the newsletter from bsg will be putting a report of this meeting out uh as part of our journey so uh you'll see a bit more of this and the video uh of this event uh thank you very much for joining have a great evening